And the Brits are, are big on the failure is no big deal. As long as you keep working hard, you'll get there sooner or later. Uh, and uh, if you're really sharp, you'll, you'll note that there are two, two uh, eight dates there. I think that 1921 was, there, uh, was just a reconnoitering uh, and not an actual attempt. But, uh, you know, in, in uh, 1924, we, we, uh, Mallory and Irvin became famous. Uh, and uh, in the 30s and, and the first, uh, uh, in 1951, Eric Shipton, was, uh, his name became prominent. He was uh, a leader in the last couple of those expeditions. And noti notably, as you'll see later on, he was very anti-science, and you'll see that that's, that's important. Um, uh, they figured it was their mountain, and they were just going to keep climbing it, keep trying, and, and then did not it kind of fell asleep a little bit, and the Swiss got permission to climb in 1952, and the British mountaineering uh, community just about had a heart attack, and they prayed very hard that the Swiss would not be successful because Everest is their mountain. And so they actually, in 1952, had a, had a, had a British training expedition on Cho Oyu, and, uh, and then, of course, in 1953, we, uh, everybody has heard the names Hillary and Tenzing, those of us who are into, into climbing will certainly know the name Hunt. He was the uh, expedition leader, and uh, he was the reluctant science adopter, and you'll see that that's very important. Uh, I got a lot of history out of this book uh, written by uh, Peter Firstbrook, uh, The Search for Mallory and Irvin, and uh, some of the things I have will come out of this book uh, in the history, but uh, you know, this book was written in 1999 after uh, Mallory uh, was found, and uh, you know, even some high altitude authors don't necessarily know their physiology. I thought it was interesting, uh, buried in the book was this comment, small blood capillaries called mitochondria, which supply blood to your muscles, become bigger and more effective. Well, I guess 80% is not bad, I guess uh, that would pass most exams and get you an A, but anyway, <laughs> in interesting, interesting. 80% is not always great. Well, this is a, a, a famous picture of, uh, this is actually, Ma hang on, sorry. This is Mallory. He was uh, very, uh, 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 what's the word? Very confident of himself, let's just say. Uh, and you could say that because he's the only guy who's actually stepping on somebody in the picture. And uh, this is a, a young guy named Irvin. And uh, this guy over here is named Odell. And he was the next strongest climber on this expedition. And uh, very interesting, when, when Mallory made his final attempt in 1924, he chose this young, very inexperienced guy named Irvin rather than Odell. And that's because he really understood the value of supplemental oxygen, and, and Irvin was kind of an engineering guy who could maybe keep the stuff working longer. So that's, he chose him because he could keep the oxygen working. And uh, this is a picture of him uh, on his way up, and uh, we're all aware of his uh, famous comment when they asked, why do, you why do you try to climb Mount Everest? Because it's there, it came from George Mallory. Well, that's, a bit, that's the early history of, the, of uh, attempts to get into, uh, or to climb Mount Everest. And uh, so this is the organizational chart, uh, effective in 1952 for the 1953 expedition. And you'll see, it was very interesting that, uh, you know, there's a joint Himalayan committee that was uh, run by the Alpine Club and the Royal Geographical Society. And I have uh, read around that for two reasons. Well, the main reason is they were the science people, and uh, they made sure that science actually occurred on this expedition. So here's what the Alpine Club thought. Only the mundane professional and altogether lower order of person would stoop to engage in elaborate preparations and heavy training or feel the need for scientific advice. This actually was what they were thinking in the early 50s. You know, we think we, we're, in a, we're in, a, in a conference where everything is about scientific evidence for whatever we're trying to do. It's hard to imagine there was actually a time when science was not only not valued, it was actually, uh, you know, it was actually anti-valued. And uh, thank goodness that the, uh, the, uh, they also had the Royal Ge Geographical Society. And they had always committed to the principle that it, would be, that it would only support expeditions that had scientific as well as exploratory or sporting aims. And the society never doubted that the heroic and the scientific could march happily side by side. The, the, the thought of the day in climbing was you just have to be tough, 
You don't have to train. You don't have to know all this stuff. You just have to be tough and keep going. They didn't learn anything from Scott. Uh, they just kept thinking that way. And uh, the Royal Geographical Society got in there uh, because they had money. And uh, thankfully, they had money to get themselves to buy the influence, as we'll see as we move along through here. Now, I talked about Eric Shipton, who was the leader of the 1951 expedition. And when the Royal Geographic Society got involved, uh, they said, uh, OK, so uh, we're going to have science in this. And Eric Shipton. Uh, was, was vehemently opposed, so they said, no problem. Shipton, you're out. John Hunt, you're in. And uh, he was told, you can be the leader, but there will be science on this expedition. Well, uh, we, we all know that they, that expedition was successful, and this is the, the book published in, in Britain, uh, written by John Hunt, The Ascent of Everest. And interesting, a year later, it was reprinted in the States, and as, you know, anything that moves across to, to the States is going to have a little bit of a different, uh, so here they, they would, they, the Americans wanted to be called the Conquest of Everest. And uh, so we had, this book was published, and what comes out of this and movies about it is, is, is really kind of gets us going into our talk today. So here, is, here are the, the main players of this expedition, John Hunt, the leader, Edmund Hillary, we know his name, Tenzing, interesting he doesn't get his last name, Norgay, on there. And uh, we go to the next page. And we have other climbers. Um, hang on, I should tell you a name you're going to hear in a moment. Uh, uh, Charles Evans. Evans, remember that name. That'll be important a little bit later on. And a guy named uh, uh, Bordelon. Uh, and uh, the, the Michael Ward was the expedition doctor who was really responsible for getting Griffith Pugh into the whole business of high altitude medicine. And of course, the physio, you know, it's interesting to see even in the book where he came in, you know, he, he was at the end of the list. The only per people that he got ahead of were the journalists. Uh, uh, I'm getting, were the journalists here, the cameraman and the correspondent. Anyway, uh, I think uh, we all know that uh, who climbed Mount Everest. I'm, some of you may not know that on, on that expedition there were there was a first attempt that uh, where their O2 supply failed and they were unsuccessful, and the second team, uh, the O2 supply worked and they were successful, and we all know their names. Uh, and uh, if the O2 had worked on the first one, uh, we would we would know Bordelon and Evans like we know Hillary and Tenzing. Um, so there's the, there's the uh, team, and, and the, the British climbing team is pretty much this group here. And they uh, got together, those who were still alive got together. Oh, hang on, I should talk about this. This is, uh, this is uh, him, uh, Griffith Pugh, uh, getting back to the airport uh, after the successful expedition, and he's here with his daughter Harriet. And this is the only negative stuff I'm going to say, but uh, this is probably one of the few times when uh, Harriet was actually smiling when she was with her dad. He was apparently a very nasty guy, very difficult to deal with, not a great family man. Even the people he worked with and really admired his work said, uh, you know, the, the, that a lot of people, family and colleagues, hated working with Griffith Pugh. And I just say that to give you, uh, to balance the history, because everything else I'm about to say is pretty good. Uh, anyway, they were they had a pretty uh, strange, uh, uh, a strange relationship, and she didn't have much to do with her dad. And uh, but 40 years later, in 1993, there was a reunion of their survivors. And sorry, you, oh, this is uh, this is the old changing the dimensions on the uh, from one to another computer. You're missing an important part of the picture, but I'll describe it in a moment. Anyway, so these, these folks got together, and uh, Griffith Pugh and his wife went, and they asked Harriet, their daughter, to take them. She didn't really want to go. Uh, she didn't really care about what he did, and, uh, but, but she went because her mom asked her to help. And interesting, they had all the expedition, now this is great, they had all the expedition members in the front row, well, second row, behind the queen and her, and her family. Uh, but Griffith Pugh at that point was in a wheelchair, and they thought that, that would, might, it might be tough to walk around him, so they sat him in the back in his wheelchair. And uh, Harriet sat up front with her mom. And uh, one of the speakers was the doctor, Dr. Michael Ward. He said, what I want to talk to, uh, about tonight is the most important reason why the 1953 expedition to Mount Everest succeeded where all its predecessors failed. 
and that was the work of the unsung hero of Mount Everest. And Harriet describes everybody in the room is going, well, who are we talking about here? And he said, Dr. Griffith Pugh. And uh, kind of a gasp in the room. And uh, he went on to talk about the things that we're going to describe in the next little while. So who is this guy? Who's Griffith Pugh? Well, he was born in 1909. He was part of a British ski team in the World Championships in 1935 and 36. He qualified for the Olympics, but he was hurt, so he didn't participate. Um, he qualified in medicine in 1938, and he was a captain in the Royal Army Medical Corps. And in World War II, he was posted, one of his postings was to the Mountain Warfare Training School in Lebanon, uh, where he, he uh, they got uh, uh, trainees uh, to be commandos. And uh, after he was done, he became known as someone who knows about cold, and that's why I like this guy so much. If you know me, I study cold. And uh, he noted early on that incoming trainees, they, they made them, they were there, it was a three-week program, and they made them ski seven and a half hours a day for three weeks, and they did a test at the end, and they had a 50% failure rate. And he said, well, that's no good. These folks should be doing better. So he instituted work-rest ratios, and he gradually increased it from three hours of work and four hours rest in the first week up to one, six hours of work and one hour of rest. And the pass rate went up to 90%. So he recognized the value of being rested and in good shape and healthy. And uh, again, that becomes, and this is a picture of him working with uh, the commandos, the commando trainees in the mountains of Lebanon. In 1950, he joined the Division of Human Physiology at the Medical Research Council in Britain, and there was a big concern about uh, pending conflict in Korea, which uh, was very, had, had cold climate and was very mountainous, so that's why they, they conscripted him. And in 1951, uh, Michael Ward, Dr. Michael Ward, uh, who had been the doctor in the, in the 1951 failed expedition, uh, heard about this guy who does this stuff about cold, but he also knows about mountains. And he went and he went to his, and when he literally first met him, Griffith was actually himself in a cold water bath, uh, being his own subject. And uh, they had a chat that went, and a relationship that went on for many years. Well, in 1952, he was the right man at the right place at the right time. He was invited by Eric Shipton to join the expedition. Now, at this time, he was only a junior uh, doctor, but he was the only game in town. He was the only, if you know about the way things work in Britain, you've got to be a senior person to get any kind of position. So he was very, very lucky with his experience, but he was the only guy who had the, the Lebanon type, type of experience. And uh, he was named to the uh, 1953 Everest expedition. And another notable thing that is very, he's very famous for is in 1967, he was a speaker at the inaugural Congress at Sports Medicine, which was CSEP 1 here in Winnipeg 50 years ago. This is one of his uh, earlier papers about the physiology of channel swimming. So he started off in cold, but he quickly obviously moved to uh, altitude. Now, this is the, the list of speakers. You may not be able to see it. I'll, I'll help you out with that. But this is the program from the University of Manitoba archives from that meeting uh, 50 years ago. And as you can see, the, uh, they had their hearts in the right place. Whoever organized this, I, I will do some supplementary uh, research to find this out. But, uh, uh, as you can see, the, the theme was the effect of the environment on athletic performance. The whole meeting, our CSEP 1, was about the environment and exercise. Now check out who was at this meeting. The other, I want to know who, who was able, who organized this, who got all these people to come to Winnipeg for a, a founding meeting. So we had uh, Ernst Jokel, uh, Rodolfo Margaria, Griffith Pugh, Bent Saltine, uh, Balky, we've all heard that name, and uh, Loring Rowell, who's uh, one of the m uh, major uh, fathers of uh, circulatory, uh, thermoregulatory circulation, and a, a, a name well known here, Gordon Cumming, and there was also some other young guy named uh, Roy Shepard was at that meeting. So, that was 40 years, 50 years uh, the 50-year uh, anniversary, there was a, a movie made, and I'll list you some of these things later on. And uh, uh, 
Griffith Pugh was not mentioned in this movie, nor any of his contributions. And although that uh, Harriet was, uh, you know, pretty much estranged from him, he had died by this time. She thought, okay, some, somebody's got to set the record straight and put this in, in, in form so that we can see what actually did he do. So we've got lots of history stuff here, but pretty much what he did is going to be on this slide. So it's a bit cluttered, but we'll work through it. So Griffith had, you know, here are his contributions to philosophy, strategy, and equipment at altitude. He had three guiding principles. Climbers should feel well at all times. And, uh, and you can't see it. Oh, yeah, you can. I can't see. Okay, well, there we go. Lessons learned from Lebanon. They must not lose their appetites. Lessons he learned from the 1952 expedition to Cho Oyu. And they must not suffer from altitude sickness. I mean, that kind of makes sense. But as you'll see, not everybody believed in altitude sickness in the first place. Um, so he, uh, he instituted acclimatization. He was the first guy to really talk about the fact that we, it should take you four weeks to get to base camp. Uh, and he was also very big on hygiene. Previously, people just sort of stayed in the villages with people, and there's lots of bad stuff to pick up in these villages. So he kept his people outside of the villages, not to be antisocial, but to keep them healthy. So but from 12 to 13,000 feet, he said, you got to spin, you got to sleep 13, 14 days in this altitude. And then as you move from 13 to 15,000, you need to spend another 14 nights at this altitude. And Everest Base Camp is at 176. I've uh, I've decided to go with feet instead of metric, because I grew up knowing that, knowing all this in feet. And up to 20,000 feet, he said, well, you can sleep only two to three nights at a time. You can climb as high as you want, but uh, but you need to, after two or three nights, you got to come back down and rest and recuperate. Back to the lessons from Lebanon. And over 23,000 feet, he said, we need to have oxygen. And when guys are, when, when people are climbing, they need to breathe four liters a minute. And uh, when they're sleeping, one liter a minute. And he said, you need to use O2 on descent as well. These are all crazy ideas at the time. Here's some other things he talked about. Fluid intake, which was not appreciated back in the, in the early 50s. He understood the negative effects of dehydration on performance and health. Efficient stoves, a lot of problems with stoves at a high altitude. He had developed some in Lebanon. The Swiss, only the, 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 the final assault team, only had a candle with them in, to try and melt snow. They clearly did not understand that. He even calculated the amount of kerosene they needed and the amount of energy required to carry the kerosene up there. Uh, in diet, he noted the negative ne uh, energy balance on Cho Oyu, so he made sure they had not only enough calories, but that it was palatable uh, in a more European-type diet. Um, just checking my time here, we're doing good. So he also uh, designed the tents and windproof clothing. He, he, he chose a cotton nylon fabric called Wincall. And uh, interesting, and we think that the 70s, uh, somebody invented this magical uh, material, but back then it was windproof, breathable, who knew? Uh, lightwear, lightweight and tear resistant, that had extra pockets in the clothing. I love a guy who likes pockets. And zips rather than buttons. Until the early 50s, they were walking around just with, with things that buttoned up. It's hard to imagine th in these days. And boot design. Uh, he made a major uh, work on trying to make them light. Uh, we heard about the Harvard uh, Fatigue Laboratory earlier today. And uh, they, had, they had determined that a foot of extra weight on the feet, and so a pound of extra weight on the feet, requires the same amount of energy as four pounds in your backpack. So he, uh, he uh, designed boots with microcellular rubber, which had half, half the density. He also added an inner waterproof layer because he understood that sweat from your feet can decrease the, the, uh, the uh, function of your insulation. So he kept the boots dry. And uh, hygiene, I've talked about that already. Uh, sleeping bags, he made sure that there was enough down in these sleeping bags for minus 40, which was not necessarily the case in previous expeditions and lots of asterisks be, 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 be in front of the open circuit oxygen systems. He was very, very adamant that we need oxygen and the open circuit is important. So I'm not gonna go through this, but this is just, you know, he, he planned the menus for everybody very, very meticulously. And these are the two kinds of uh, oxygen systems they had. And this is the closed circuit system. Obviously, so that, well, I'll start with this. This is the open circuit where you just flow uh, uh, oxygen, 
into your mask, and obviously if you're flowing oxygen into a mask, obviously a lot of that is going to be wasted. Um, whereas the closed circuit is much more efficient because you breathe oxygen in, you breathe out oxygen and CO2, you scrub the CO2 out and you just keep recirculating the oxygen, much more efficient. But at that point in time, it was much less uh, uh, reliable. So here's some interesting data, and this is probably the only data I'm going to show you here. So in 1952, the guys with the candle only, they had nothing, and they, they went up at a rate of 233 feet an hour. Uh, this is the group that went up and, and brought uh, supplies up to the, the high camp for the first assault party, and they had the open circuit system at 40 years a minute. They went up 430 feet an hour, and then the, uh, the, the first uh, assault party, which was Evans and Bordelon, with the closed circuit system, you can see it was very efficient, like more than twice the, the, uh, the rate of ascent. The only problem is that one of those broke down and they had to return. Again, the second group that came up to, uh, to set up the camp for uh, the second assault party, almost 500 feet an hour. And then, of course, you've got the, the two really fit people who were even e with the same rate of oxygen. They, they went uh, pretty fast and and obviously we'll, we'll talk about what happened to them later. So, much more efficient, but much more unreliable, and Griffith Pugh said he spent all his time working on this, and Bordelon spent all his time working on this, and uh, that's why we don't know their first names. Everybody knows their names today. Well, the night, the final night before their final assault, uh, they were, uh, Hillary and Tenzing, were alone in their high camp above the South Call, and I'll quote from, uh, from Harriet's book. That evening, sheltered by a tent made of fabric chosen by Pew, they, uh, they started up the cooker made to Pew's uh, specifications and feeling it worked like a charm, brewed large amounts of lemon juice and water. After consuming what Hillary described as a, satis a satisfying meal out of our store of delicacies recommended by Pew, they retired for the night using sleeping oxygen courtesy of Pew resting on air mattresses also developed by Pew. Now don't get uh, fooled by the fact that this was written by his daughter because uh, we're going to see some uh, other folks who, who uh, verified the, this, the value of all of this. After rising, they drank large quantities of fluid in a determined effort to prevent the weakness arising from dehydration. Then having donned their protective clothing designed by Pew and their oxygen sets, they set out for the summit of Everest and they summited just five hours later. For Pew, it was a truly magnificent personal achievement, a, valid, a validation of his ideas and his indefatigable work before the expedition. You would think that would be great for him, but not so fast. The few people in the climbing world who knew anything about what Pew was doing found it hard to credit that as a scientist, he was capable of making a useful contribution. Uh, the film Conquest of Everest in 1953 made little mention of the science and made no reference to Pew at all. Uh, and John Hunt's book, The Ascent of Everest, only mentioned Pew's contribution to the diet. And uh, he did note later that if he gave too much attention to the contributions of science, this is typical British macho stuff, the achievement of the climbers would appear to be less glorious. And the 50th anniversary film, as I said, Race for Everest in 19, 2003, did not mention either Griffith's name or his role in the expedition. So he who laughs last, uh, well, when he got back in the climbing community, he may have been ignored, but he became a star at the MRC. He published six articles in academic journals in the following year, two further articles in a geographical journal, and uh, it set the stage for a long story career in altitude medicine with notables such as John West, Jim Millage, and others. And we'll see that in just a moment. This was merely the start of a brilliant scientific career. Everest, uh, uh, Everest opened the door to what Michael Ward, uh, the guy who discovered him in the cold bath, would later describe as a cornucopia, a cornucopia of science. And. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the stuff uh, post-Everest, but this is just one example. Uh, the Silver Hut Expedition, to, uh, as, which is spelled wrong, Expedition, sorry about that, to, Macal to Makalu in 1966 to 61. It was nine months long. Uh, the climbing leader was Edmund Hillary. 
uh, and the scientific leader was Griffith Pugh. And uh, you may not be able to read, well, I guess you can read the names. This is, this is, this is a group of uh, five people you'd want to be standing on a mountain with. Uh, you've got Jim Millage. If you know altitude research, these are all huge names. Jim Millage, John West, Griffith Pugh, Michael Ward, and Mike Gill. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty good climbing team right there. And so just some examples of a couple of papers. Uh, you know, muscular exercise, he wrote that on himself about Mount Everest, but just check this out. Arterial saturation during exercise at high altitude. West, we've talked about Gill, Millage, Pew, and Ward, but also another guy named Lahiri. And so 30 years ago when I was doing my PhD in respiratory physiology and dabbling in altitude, all these guys in Lahiri, these guys were at the end of their careers, and they all started sort of with Griffith back in the 60s. So it's very, very interesting. Uh, he, uh, he was also, now he knows about altitude, so obviously the, one of the next things that happened was the, the, uh, the high altitude Olympics of Mexico City. So he was involved in preparation for that. And uh, I think that's all I'm gonna show you about that slide. So here are some of the myths that he had to fight. It's, it's good enough just to be tough. That's what the mountaineering, uh, it was kind of a gentleman's society, and they just said, you know, we just we don't have to prepare. We don't need science. We just be tough, and you'll make it sooner or later. And science degrades the achievement of climbing. Thing, things like uh, fluid is not important, and uh, and uh, maybe one of the uh, no, it's he wouldn't have known this at the time. But if, if you remember, he didn't. Uh, Mallory didn't take Odell with him in 19. 24, which basically saved Odell's life, but uh, he was a, a major proponent of, the, a proponent of the idea that altitude is not debilitating. It's hard to imagine that people thought these things, and these are the things that Griffith Pugh had to deal with. So, uh, just so you think that this might be a biased uh, opinion from, from uh, me and and his daughter, here are some pretty famous folks. Tom Hornbein, who made the first ascent of the Everest West Ridge in 1963, said Pew's altitude policies were accepted rules of high altitude climbing. A bit of gospel with, unfortunately, the attribution lost, lost along the way. A lot of people don't know that what they do when they go to high altitude is based on what Griffith Pew said back in the 50s. Oswald, Ol Oswald Oltz, as an Australian climber and physiologist, reflected the Swiss would have climbed Everest in 1952 if they'd had a scientist like Griffith Pew. They should have had a slogan, all, all the way with Pew in 52, I don't know. Anyway, John Severinghaus, a very famous respiratory physiologist from the CVRI in San Francisco in 2004, commented on his recommendations, what was good 50 years ago is still good today. Pew's emphasis on adequate energy and fluid intake at altitude is as sound today as it was then. And some other guy in 2017, well, wants to close with this idea. Indeed, we do stand on the shoulders of giants like Griffith Pugh, a scientist who demonstrated the value of science when science was not valued. So, uh, I'd like to say thanks for uh, attending, and as always, that I say at the end of a talk, and on behalf of Griffith Pugh, keep cool, but don't freeze. Thank you.